Today's presentation will be an in-depth study of database security through SQL injection. This is an advanced lecture on SQL injection, and we will go through very technical details of how SQL injection is being executed. SQL injection is one of the top attack methods and techniques to gain access into confidential information residing in those databases. It is primarily performed through web applications where the input is not properly sanitized, which are then passed into the database for execution. So for today's presentation, I presume you already understand about general programming languages and scripting weaknesses inherent in many web developments. Another prerequisite knowledge is that you already know the different types of databases like MySQL, PostgreSQL, and the likes in companion with Windows operating systems and Linux operating system. And for today's in-depth analysis, you must know SQL commands at your fingertips. And then we'll dive into an illustration of SQL injection by tracing the data input. As a start, most SQL injections are inserted into web forms. Web forms meaning a web page that takes in an input or multiple inputs of a form that are then submitted into the web application server. We didn't know exactly what type of web server it is running on this host. We can use scanning tools like NASA's, Rapid7, or even more basically NMAP to get an information of the system, after which we can find vulnerabilities pertaining to this type of web service so that we can exploit the web forms much quicker. There can be a lot of information from the NAD regarding the web service and its associated versions with its vulnerability. In fact, Many a times, we can find exploits that allow us to bypass the web form's control. The data input comes from the user and it is then sent over to the web server. At the web server area, there can be a lot of processing involved and it is then sent over to the database for querying this particular user and its password. Generally, once the data is placed into the web server, the web server has a lot of free access into the database server. We need to understand what query does the web server send to the database now that we have direct connection and command execution to the database. Firstly, we need to speculate the SQL statement that is being input from the web server in order for the user to log into the system. Logically, we also need to map out the potential outcomes from the query. It could be that the login information has been mailed to an email that the username is unrecognized or there are some types of server error with debug information. Server error with debug information can present a lot of findings for us to further the exploit. We then have to check for input sanitization from the web form by dumping single code or double code into the web form. Either of the username or password few can be used to dump those invalid characters that might not be checked before passing into the database. The list goes on. But the whole idea is to get some form of invalid returns from the server indicating that it does not sanitize inputs. It does not check against funny characters that can potentially bypass the intended business function. This can cause a lot of trouble if the server is not securely designed for each and every web input. There can be thousands of input within a web server and all a hacker need is one web form that is not checked to exploit. At this juncture, we have successfully recognized a section where the web input form is vulnerable. As such, we can try inserting the following commands so that we can gain unauthorized access into the system. We can use the or x equal x command, which is always true. And hence, it will always allow us to bypass authentication once the database query returns true. More often used is or one equals to one because one is always one. And as such, the database query will return true. Once the web application server receives a true command from the database, it will authenticate you into the system. We need to identify all the columns within the table that we are inquiring on. This is important because certain columns can provide us very important information so that we can use it to gain confidential data. So the database has two ways of responding to you. If the server returns an error, it means that this field, email, does not exist at all. Hence, we will have to try another method. However, if the server returns you that a user is not found, it means that the column does exist. So we need to keep guessing. And for a column like email, it could be e underscore mail or electronic underscore mail or the likes. 
Whatever the case is, we need to find the important columns. Also, if you realize at the end of the SQL command, we ended it with a double dash single quote. This is to end the command immediately. As can be seen here, we are again trying to guess out important column names so that we can get information that necessary for us to gain further privileges or sensitive information. It can be for login ID, user ID, password, full name, or even credit card information. In fact, we can move over to new user registration forms to look at what are the input values coming in, or being specific on the web form so that we can map the column names properly. Even more importantly is that we will not be staying on the same table for our query of sensitive data. There can be much more tables around in the database that we are querying. For example, the database could have human resource table, could have member, could have employee tables. These are all potentially critical information residing in a database in which we can extract. There are only two ways for a database server to respond. And firstly, if there is an error from the server, it will automatically mean that the guess is wrong. On the other hand, if we got a value response, it means we found a table and can proceed further. For example, if we input member as a table name to look into, it means that we are able to use member.login underscore ID and member.password for us to access columns within a member table. Next is finding out exactly who are the valid users within this table for logging into the system. We can use more common names like Alex, Bob, John, etc. This allows us to get hold of a valid user within the database much quickly. Another way to quicken this process is, for example, we're exploiting an internal use system. We can find out who are the internal users through social media sites that state the employee's name and their associated company. Most of the time, it can be extremely difficult to find all the columns within the table because every organization structured the tables differently. Here can be multiple foreign keys or associations with other tables that make it impossible to find all the column names. As such, this is only recommended if you have done your due diligence in regards to the table structure. Updating rows is a much easier and straightforward process because you do not need all the column names in order to execute a SQL command. Knowing the necessary table names will be sufficient. For example, if we know the email, password, login ID, full name, we can easily change the email so that we can complete a forget password request. The forget password request will then send information to your intended email so they can properly set a new password for the user. We can also watch out for default database behaviors that usually are left untouched by database administrators. These behaviors help us uncover even more information so that we can understand the architecture of the database. At the same time, we are looking into further advanced SQL exploits to check against user rights on the database system. For example, in Microsoft SQL Server, certain users have different time delays from the system. The statement wait for used with the delay argument causes SQL Server to pause for the specified period of time. This feature can be leveraged to review information, such as whether the web application's connection to the database is made as a system administrator. We can further the attack by using extracted data like password or usernames to gain access into other systems. Many administrators reuse passwords across systems within an enterprise because of the lack of security key management. At the same time, we can also use XP underscore command shell to help us explore the internal network within the enterprise network environment. The XP CMD shell option is a SQL Server configuration option that enables system administrators to control whether the XP command shell extended store procedure can be executed on the system. This can be another opportunity for us to further our attacks on the database systems that we intrude. Of course, in order to defend your databases, you need to sanitize input. For example, there can be multiple quotes coming into your web forms, and hence, we need to be able to stop those intrusion entering your database. This can be primarily controlled within your web application systems. 
As can be seen here, this is an example code on the left side. We have an unsecured coding method, which calls for the database query. It allows SQL injections in the web forms without sanitizing the input first. On the right side, we have a secured coding method where we force the incoming data to become a string first before we pass it into the query statement. Hence, this allows us to control the type of data input from the user. Another method is to set the access control from different applications. We have to clearly identify the differences between a select statement and an update statement. We can force the web application to be only allowed to use select statements within any update permission. This ensures that hackers have no power to manipulate the data within the databases. This is a tower and good process to deter alterations to your data. Another method is to store the procedure and call this procedure instead of letting the web form run dynamic queries. This enables the start procedures to be limited to certain commands, which cannot be overwritten by the user. This gives better security control over the set of instructions that the web server can execute on the database. We can also further isolate the web server and lock it into a different region of the network. As such, if the web server gets compromised, it does not affect the database or the rest of the network because it is limited in its reach. Many public facing servers are located within the demilitarized zone. So a demilitarized zone is a physical or logical sub network that separates an internal local area network from other untrusted networks. Next is to restrict the type of errors that are being shown on the returns from the web server to the user. The errors help the hacker pinpoint exactly where are the weak spots of the web farm and if their attempts are successful or unsuccessful. So this presentation should give you a great idea of how SQL injection is created. If you want more technical tutorials in regards to SQL injection or other computer hacking techniques, feel free to subscribe to this channel so that you can learn more about cybersecurity.